So moving on to the left ventricle, just a bit about its position. So remember the, the heart is angled in the mediastinum. So the right ventri ventricle forms most of the anterior surface and the left ventricle, which is this part of the heart, actually sits a bit posterior to the right ventricle and it sits anterior to the left atrium. So that's just a bit about the position of the left ventricle. So I've just dissected away the wall of the left ventricle and we're looking inside at some of the structures. So when blood enters from the left atrium into the left ventricle, it passes through the left atrioventricular orifice. So this orifice forms this fibrous ring on which you've got the mitral valve attaching. So the mitral valve is also sometimes called the bicuspid valve because it has two cusps. You've got an anterior cusp which is larger and you've got a posterior cusp at the back which is a little bit smaller. So you've got these two cusps, so anteriorly you've got the anterior cusp and you've got the smaller posterior cusp at the back. And just like in the right ventricle, it's attached to a papillary muscle by these chordae tendinae, so these cords which you can see here and I'm just kind of highlighting them in yellow and you've got the papillary muscle here anchoring it to the ventricular wall. So the reason it's called a mitral valve is because apparently it resembles a uh, bishop's mitra. So I guess you could say that you've got these two cusps, so you've got an anterior cusp and you've got a posterior cusp. So that may help you remember the sort of shape of the mitral valve. So it was supposed to re resemble a bishop's mitre. And this view here just shows a, a horizontal section, so we're looking at it from the top and you can see the, the two sort of valves here of the bicuspid valve or mitral valve. So they open in towards the ventricle. So just like the right ventricle, you've got trabeculae carnae in the left ventricle. So they're a little bit different in that they're a little bit finer and smaller. But the general appearance is the same, where you have the three different types of trabeculae carnae. So you've got the papillary muscles, which are not tethered at one end. So one end is anchored to the ventricular wall, and the other provides attachment to the chordae tendinae. And then you've got the other two types of trabeculae carnae, which are tethered along their entire length, and which are tethered at either end and three in the middle. So check out the tutorial on the right ventricle for a bit more details there. So I've removed the ventricle wall here but um, just kind of drawn a sort of vague outline for the wall here so you can see the two papillary muscles so you've got an anterior papillary muscle and you've got a posterior papillary muscle. So the function of the papillary muscles is the same as the right ventricle so together with the chordae tendinae they hold the mitral valves in place so you've got the mitral valves held so that they're pointing in towards the left ventricle. If you didn't have these structures tethering the valve in place, when the left ventricle contracts and blood is forced backwards against the valves, without being anchored in place like this, the valves would invert so they'd be reflected back into the atrium and then blood would be allowed to flow back into the left atrium, which wouldn't be good. So just rotating the model around again, um, just to mention the left ventricular wall is very thick, it's much thicker than the right ventricular wall and the reason for this is that it has to pump blood to the entire body and to the head. So it's pumping against a much higher resistance than the right ventricle. So the right ventricle just pumps blood to the lungs but the left ventricle needs a thicker myocardium so that it can pump blood to the whole body. So. When blood is pumped out of the left ventricle, it ascends through this outflow tract, this left ventricular outflow tract, which is known as the aortic vestibule. So this outflow tract is continuous with the ascending aorta above. And if I rotate the model round, you can see the relationship of the aortic vestibule to the right ventricular outflow tract. So the right ventricular outflow tract here sits anteriorly to the left ventricular outflow tract. So I've just removed some structures from the model so we can visualize the aortic valve. So up here we've got the ascending aorta 
and you'll notice that there's two vessels coming off here. These are the coronary arteries, so you've got the left and the right coronary artery coming off right at the beginning of the ascending aorta. So if I just remove this for a moment, you can see the valve, the aortic valve. So I've just isolated that valve here and you can see that it's got it's similar in structure to the pulmonary valve. So you've got these three semilunar cusps and you've got a right, a left and a posterior cusp. So what's important to talk about is the relationship of this valve to the coronary arteries. So immediately above the aortic valve on the right and left you've got the right coronary artery and the left coronary artery. So these arteries open in the sinuses of the right and the left semilunar cusps. So just coming again to this horizontal section of the heart you can see the aortic valve here with its th three cusps. So you've got these right left and posterior cusps and you can see the opening of the left coronary artery into the left cusp and you can see the opening of the right coronary artery into the right cusp. So this diagram here shows nicely the configuration of the aortic valve. So what we're looking at is we've cut open a section of the aorta and the outflow tract and we've opened it up flat. So we've got the three cusps in a row here. So you've got the left cusp and the right cusp. And just like the pulmonary valve, you've got this thickening called the nodule. And you've got this thin part, which is the lunulus. And then you've got the aortic sinus, which is this area between the wall of the vessel and the cusp. So you've got this area called the aortic sinus. And in the right and the left cusps, you've got the openings, the origins of the right and the left coronary arteries opening into this sinus. So this is important to know about because during systole, during ventricular contraction, you get blood rushing out through the ventricles and out through the aortic valves into the ascending aorta. And then during diastole, when the ventricles re relax, you get blood flowing back down the ascending aorta and you get pooling of the blood in these sinuses. So during diastole, the sinuses fill with blood and it then fills the coronary arteries with blood. So this is important to know. So essentially you get, mo you get most of the coronary blood flow occurring during diastole because of this relationship of the origins of the coronary arteries to the aortic sinuses. So that's the left side of the heart and that completes my series on the four chambers of the heart and some of the features that you need to know about.